Mattel has created a thunderstorm by releasing 15 new dolls and it's only February. I know it's been a few months since y'all have seen me. I have a lot of tea to spill in today's video. First, be sure to give this video a thumbs up, turn on notifications and hit subscribe so you never miss the tea on the toys you love. We'll be taking a deep dive into Monster High's unusual designs, controversial price points, and questionable quality. Yep, that's a tear in the tights of a stock photo. Before we dive in deep, if you're looking to complete your OG Monster High collection, I am auctioning off all of my out of box dolls. All the dolls will start off at only $1. I'll be doing $5 deals. I'll be doing giveaways. I love doing crazy things on there. So on my first stream, I sold a Comic-Con Ghoulia for only $15 and everyone went wild. You all were so great on there. It was easily one of my favorite memories of my life doing that live stream. You all know how passionate I am about making sure things are available internationally. So of course, giveaways and auctions are available internationally. So join me February 25th and 26th on the WhatNot app. The link is in the description for you to sign up. And if you sign up using that link, you will get $15 in credit. So you can use that on any purchase. You could use $5 on my page, $5 on another person's page. That means for those $5 deals I'll be doing, you could get three completely free dolls. Anyways, Haunt Couture Round 2 dropped on February 10th at 9 a.m. Beginning with the new Frankie Stein doll, the line dubbed Midnight Runway has invoked some very loud opinions from the Monster High community. As always, I'll be giving an insider scoop and sharing little known facts, so pay close attention. In order to understand the gravity of this launch, we have to understand the fan response when the dolls first leaked. On Friday, February 3rd, Monster High's official Instagram page teased the upcoming launch with a mysterious carousel of Frankie Stein, Spectra Vondergeist, and Cleo Denial. Only a day later, the official Instagram page shared a full look and fans did not hold back when sharing their thoughts. We will not be buying, one user wrote. It's giving Playline. And you know y'all can just release the Gen 1 style dolls in stores again instead of making them quote unquote haunt couture every time. This looks like a normal line of dolls that would release for $25. Wow. What did you all think of the line's initial leak with these promo images? Spectra and Cleo aren't even released, so comment your thoughts on them below. Many fans shared their excitement though, because this is the first Spectra Vondergeist doll to be released in over seven years, with the last time she had a doll being Mall Monsteristas back in 2015. It was pointed out that when taking a closer look at the promotional stock images for Frankie Stein, you can notice a tear in her tights. An oversight that, let's be real, is a little yikesy. We're all human. Human, mistakes happen, but come on, come on now. We have the controversial Frankie Stein doll here, courtesy of Mattel, which I'll be going into more detail in just a little bit. There is some disturbing details with these launches that no one's really discussed that we have to get into. But first, we have to discuss the ample amount of fans who are outraged that Frankie is even a part of this line. Lots of you complain that a different OG character would have been perfect for this line, and everyone's confused as to why Mattel didn't think of that. Frankie, again? Y'all know other characters exist, right? We love the OG5 ghouls, but let others shine too. Why didn't you guys do Operetta for this line? Her mask could have been so sick. Hello, Operetta deserves to be in this. She's the Phantom of the Opera's daughter. Come on, Monster High. Sounds like lots of you are tired of the same five ghouls on rotation and would have preferred if Operetta was in this line instead. Fun fact, all the way back in 2010, Operetta was originally going to be one of the main five characters. Cleo actually replaced her. Operetta was going to be the school's mean girl, but Mattel felt like kids would not know who the Phantom of the Opera is, and ultimately she was replaced with Cleo. Now, I could not imagine a world without our queen Cleo, but Operetta is still easily one of Monster High's best characters ever. On October 31st, Garrett Sander revealed a prototype for Operetta being part of the classroom line from 2011. This doll was never released, and the first Operetta doll was unveiled in 2012. I'll actually be auctioning off my first Operetta doll on Whatnot, which has a wild backstory, and I am so excited for one of you to own her and give her a good home. Now we have to remember though, Haunt Couture Wave 1 initially had three characters and then later revealed two more dolls. So it is possible that Operetta may be revealed at Comic-Con as an extension of this line. Comment down below your thoughts. Do you think they'll still include Operetta as part of this line? One of you shared with me on Instagram that is actually the 35th anniversary of Phantom of the Opera on Broadway and I found out it's the 80th anniversary of the 1943 theatrical release of the Phantom of the Opera 
movie. So it's possible Mattel is planning something big. Only time will tell. So there's a lot of critiques from fans, but I think we need to break down the pattern that actually unfolds with every single Skelector release. I've taken a deep document of this, so keep on watching as we expose the alarming trend in a moment. But first, let's take a look at the brand new Midnight Runway Frankenstein. When comparing the packaging to the original Haunt Couture launch, you'll notice the coffin-shaped boxes are the exact same in size, but trades the graphic damask pattern packaging on Haunt Couture Wave 1 for an embossed finish with raised stitches, foiled graphic logos, and glossy elements. The interior of the packaging swaps the quilted background for what looks like satin or melting liquid. Unlike Haunt Couture Wave 1, which includes a slot for the diary, Midnight Runway does not include a diary and instead includes an invitation letter. Frankie was designed by the fabulous Glenda Chu, who also worked on Haunt Couture Claudine and Laguna Blue. Frankie has a dramatic and fun ensemble that plays with sheer textures and strappy accents. I know a lot of you hate her, but I have to say that I think this outfit would actually translate really well into a costume for a person. I just see it being worn on like New York Fashion Week. It's giving very the blondes. I put this little sweater on, it was getting too cold, but isn't it cute though? Hot Topic's really coming through with the looks. Anyways, it's pretty eye-catching. The colors are great, but that doesn't mean I won't point out where they went wrong. Just give me a second to get to that part. You'll notice that Midnight Runway actually has an entirely different screening from Haunt Couture Frankie with bolder brows, an alternate eye style, and a slightly different lash technique. The doll has fully saran hair and is on the original Frankie Stein body from 2010. She's my personal favorite from the line. I just really identify with the colors that they chose for her. It's hard to be unsympathetic for that reason, but I know it's my job to stay subjective and give y'all the most authentic, honest information about this launch, which is what I'm gonna do. I will always keep it 100 with y'all and I am not going to hold back when I share what needs to be changed on this doll in order for it to be better received. The Midnight Runway collection is compared a lot to Ghoul's Rule, which was Monster High's first masquerade line back in 2012. And now about that disturbing trend I was discussing. The criticism around Frankie isn't new. In fact, it's a consistent pattern we should shine a light on. There has been an abundant amount of criticism for this collector line since all the way back in 2020 when the line initially relaunched with the Grady Twins and the Skelector Pennywise doll. Back at that time, fans shared similarly negative critiques about Pennywise and the Grady Twins, which are both now considered some of the most coveted Monster High dolls of all time. This is why we can't trust y'all. I can't. I can't. <sighs> yeah, serious. The dolls came out pretty good, but they are too basic for their overpriced. Y'all be lying. These are not that good. Only because they're monster high. I really thought this would be an inspired by, not a copy of. They lack accessories in the creative fashion sense we have come to recognize from a Monster High doll line, especially for the price. No disrespect to the artist, I love the attempt, but I'll have to think about the execution a little longer. At that point in time back in 2020, the Grady Twins retailed at $75, with Pennywise retailing at $59.99. The response was that the dolls were overpriced, generally boring, uninspired, and it created this expectation that the dolls weren't gonna sell very well. That comment section quickly transformed when fans went into a frenzy after the dolls sold out in only two minutes. People were distressed in the comment section begging Mattel to do a restock. How can I buy them from Spain? I'm gonna buy them both, so please tell us quick. We're a little excited, as you can see. Please, please, please bring her back. My daughter is super obsessed with Pennywise right now, and she's true. I can't buy this doll for less than $250. But the pattern continued over and over and over again. A plethora of fans complaining the dolls were lackluster, unoriginal, hideous, uninspired, overpriced. Only for them to sell out and all that criticism be drowned out by people complaining that they weren't even able to get the dolls because they're so popular. This pattern was brought to a fever pitch one year ago during Haunt Couture Drop One, when Mattel's long-term plan went into motion. At that time, the brand expanded the PR list and created the Monster High Alumni Program. Mattel was sending out giant glamorous PR packages to both super popular popular influencers with large platforms, and then niche doll collectors who were just true, genuine fans of Monster High. But why did they do that? Well, 
They did it in hopes of gaining adoration for Frankie Stein, Draculaura, and Claudine Wolf's debut appearance for the first time in over three years. This was a big deal. That line, particularly the Draculaura, is now one of the most sought after to ever exist. But similar to Pennywise, it wasn't always seen that way. Fans' initial response to the Haunt Couture promo images was that they were overpriced and lacked detail and quality when compared to their competitor doll lines. In case you don't remember, because I can't seem to forget it. <laughs> Trauma. <laughs> the influencers who received these packages faced public shaming and ridicule for boasting these dolls as well-designed or reasonably priced. Some members of the community felt these reviews were way too biased because the dolls were sent to them for free and accused them of lying, leading some of the influencers to break down into tears, expressing how distressed they were from the overwhelming amount of hate they were getting for their reviews. This uproar actually caused a mini campaign to go around on Instagram of some fans asking people to stop blaming or ridiculing the influencers for simply doing their job by promoting the dolls. The first line of Haunt Couture dolls initially retailed at $75, and while the initial response was negative critique, the line is now known as a super hit for the franchise. Will the same be said for Midnight Runway, though? Here's where things begin to take a turn. I don't know what I'm doing in this video, I swear. <laughs> Influencers who were sent the PR package this year have been candid about their disappointment of the Midnight Runway Frankie Stein doll, echoing the criticism of the rest of the fandom that this launch is lacking in the details that its predecessor had. I try not to share my thoughts or opinions. I am too involved in this industry and, and I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings, okay? I am, I'm a very sensitive person. My feelings get hurt very easily, but here's what should have been done differently. Haunt Couture Drop 1 included VUM stands. VUM stands for vacuumized metal, if you didn't know. VUM stands, combs, they came with bags, they had diaries. Monster High is known for its lore. I think in order for the Skelector dolls to be successful, they need to continue the Gen 1 lore. I don't know if they don't have copywriters or like people to work on the diaries or something, but I would argue it is vital to the success of Monster High to maintain their promise of having this world building experience with their collector dolls. Secondly, I'm not really with the majority. I would still buy this doll regardless because I'm that type of collector. Like I'm a completionist. However, I do feel like this doll should have included more. It's a collector doll. Statistically, every single collector doll up until this Frankie has sold out the same day it's been listed. Most of the time selling out in under 10 minutes. So this doll is an anomaly. It's one time this doll did not fully sell out. We will see how Cleo and Spectre's launches go, but it's been a week and the doll is still in stock. One time, an anomaly. Two times is a pattern. I'm hoping for our ghouls that the launches continue to be successful, but I also realize that that requires that the products be well received by the consumers. I have linked her down below if you're interested in pre-ordering her. There's another side to this conversation though, and that's Scalpers. Mattel Creations has been called out on numerous occasions for doing very little to stop bots and scalpers from causing these launches to sell out in minutes and end up on eBay for three to four times the price. Because of scalpers, it's a little hard to gauge how well received these launches are sometimes from the fandom. So we can't even say a product is necessarily a hit just because it sells out. I think a doll's popularity can be more accurately measured by its resale value. So Draculaura, Pennywise, Grady Twins, super popular. Dracula, on the other hand, was the first and only Skelector doll to end up getting restocked later in the year, very briefly and unannounced, but Dracula doesn't hold much of a resale value. And what about international fans? Don't worry, I didn't forget about you. I got your back. One of the most frequent criticisms of Monster High is that their launches are not made accessible internationally. Mattel Creations is one of the only websites for international fans to get access to these launches, sometimes even for non-limited releases like the Boo Original Creep Productions or Real Drama. So international fans rely on the Mattel Creations website to be able to make these purchases, and when scalpers are buying these launches up, it makes it even more difficult for them to have access. With all that being said, we've covered the criticism and as much as I wish things were cut and dry, they simply are not. And there's another side to this story. This doesn't necessarily invalidate any of the negative critiques or even bring justification as to why these launches or dolls are what they are. But if you're a Monster Eye super fan, a doll lover, you're just curious about how the industry works, 
you're going to want to know this information. In order to get into that topic, we also have to explore Monster High's Playline dolls. And today we'll be discussing its latest leaks, Abby Abominable, which I am so excited for, and Skultimate Secrets Wave 2. If you're unaware, Skultimate Secrets Wave 1 dropped in January at local retailer Palmart store in Los Angeles, but hasn't even been made available in major retailers like Target, Amazon, or Walmart. So you can see why it'd be a little shocking that Wave 2 has already leaked with Wave 1 not even really being in stores. Dare I say these leaks actually overshadowed the Midnight Runway launch or distracted from it by being a quick fan favorite and one of the most promising launches of Monster High Gen 3. Fans absolutely adore this Frankie. Aw, their prosthetic is glittery. New leg, OMG. Basically every single character was given a compliment by fans. Ah, I love her. Oh my God, she is perfect. But of course there was still some critique. Those shorts are a hate crime. Fans are still a little concerned with the quality of the Playline dolls. This is where the topic becomes split into two categories. Critique of collector dolls, which are targeted towards the ages of 14 and up, and critique of Playline dolls, which targets the ages of six to eight. Many of you, even under my own YouTube channel, comment that you understand that Playline is not always going to be on the level of collector quality with premium level details because it's meant for kids. But then there's also an abundant amount of you who argue dolls are for kids is just baseless justification for getting cheap quality. This is where I'd like to provide some information so you can decide where you lie on the topic. I'm not going to try to sway you one way or another. That's all I'm going to say. This comes into conversation because Monster High's original brand promise was unique level of detail and a approach to fashion dolls, while also comparing Monster High's current product and price points to its competitors, which have turned the fashion doll game on its head, having premium level details and quality on dolls under $25. This isn't to say Monster High should be just like its competitors. It shouldn't. It's Monster High, and it's meant to be that way. That's just to say why this expectation is being put on the brand. With that being said, Monster High differs in how its products are made from its competitors. Firstly being that Mattel is a publicly owned company, while most of its competitors are privately owned companies, which means Mattel has to report profits and is at the mercy of its investors who get to make decisions. Mattel got daddies to please. But why the product may differ in quality depends on the factories. The price of VUM has definitely inflated in the past decade and is generally seen as very expensive by toy companies. The goal sometimes for a designer is to meet buyer demands. In this context, buyer is not consumers. We're consumers. Buyers refer to retailers like Walmart, Target, and Amazon. Mattel may be trying to meet a buyer's demand that a product be under $25. In order to meet that budget, Mattel designers then have to decide what to keep and what to cut and what's most important for the product to make it both playable and profitable. Because at the end of the day, these companies are always going to be corporations. Let's not forget that. They're corporations. They're trying to make money. But then what about the other side? collector dolls. Mattel released the Holiday Clio Induce set, which also received a lot of criticism from fans. The set, which retails at $60, is described as playline quality, and while it's praised for its unique packaging, gets a lot of hate for the doll's designs. I'm crying how bad this is. Looks like budget dolls. Yes, the two-pack I was hoping for! But the dress, mama. Nor. I'm sure it's Neffer's doing. She told them that the dress looked cute. I was so excited to see this. Then noticed the clothes. I'll only get it if it's under $50, since I'd have to redress them, especially Cleo. The packaging is nice. And, and that, that's all. Meh. Barbie quality. Again. Mermaid dress with simple pattern. Groundbreaking. It's giving 2016 Gen 2, and I love Monster High, but I was hoping for a Valentine's pack we'd get something a little more unique and less safe. Like, besides the accessories, I'm not really getting Valentine's. I'm just happy they're finally acknowledging the true power couple of Monster High and not their new They're Broken Up junk in Haunt Couture in Gen 3. The targeted demographic is feeling neglected by Mattel because it feels like their opinions aren't being heard. And how do we explain this? Again, this is just information not justification, do with it what you will. The reason that Mattel's collector dolls are sometimes on par with a Playline doll from a decade ago largely has to do with price inflation and the cost of goods 
going up so high. Shipping containers, cost of materials, yada, 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 yada. It's, it's sometimes astonishing to look back because I have a majority of the original Monster High Dolls in box to see the level of detail they were able to accomplish at that time because there's just no way they would be able to afford it today. With that being said, there's really no explaining design choices. Like that's, that's up to artistic vision. However, I will say that toy designers do have to convince higher ups of their designs. So they're already in a somewhat hostile environment where they're like, no, look, like this is why this is a good idea. And this is why we should include this in the product. Toys are generally influenced by marketing. So for example, marketing might say, change that belt for a purse because purses sell better. And and that's like a poor example. Or, or like if a doll is blue, it's like, no, blue is a boy color change her to pink. Those are higher up decisions that, that designers are at the mercy of. So sometimes that's what's happening. With that being said, Monster High has had some really fabulous designs, but if you even look at the older Monster High dolls, they've always been known for their clashing patterns, campy outfits, and unusual styles. I made a post on my Instagram asking what you find most important on a doll. Is it the quality? Is it the design? Is it the price point? All of your answers varied on which factors were non-negotiable. But if you really listen to why fans are in an uproar about the Midnight Runway collection, or really any of the collector dolls, it's that the dolls are being pitched as a collector doll, which makes them inaccessible to a large part of the demographic. But yet they're not necessarily doing anything that elevates them or separates them from the Playline dolls. So then what happens? These collectors then turn to the Playline dolls because they weren't able to access the collector dolls. And when the Playline dolls are only slightly below the quality of the collector dolls, the fans are feeling betrayed. Now we already know this, I've said it a few times, but Monster High Gen 3, the, the Playline dolls, collectors are not the targeted demographic. It's meant for kids. So the approach to the doll is gonna be different than when they approach creating a collector doll. Now, I don't know if all of you can identify with this, but I remember being 10 and 11 collecting Monster High as a kid. And what stood out to me for the doll line was the quality and the details. The fact that some of the dolls had teeny tiny rings. There was always varnish on the shoes and accessories. Premium details were always an element of doll play that my childhood friends and I always noticed. Now, technically, 10 is like aged out of the demographic. You, you get put into like this other category. But I believe for the longevity and sustainability of a brand, the IP's legacy will stand the test of time if certain elements are being honored and acknowledged. If your doll was released five years ago and people are still dressing their dolls in that outfit, you did something right. If your doll was released two years ago and people are still using it for repaints, you did something right. Children go through phases where they need a toy for months. Every time the commercial's on the TV, they need that toy and then they buy it and then they break it and they throw it away within a day. So if you made a product that a child adores so much that it resonates with them so deeply as a kid that they then think about it into adulthood, you did something right. The reason people even become collectors in the first place is because they were once a child that became so attached to a toy or franchise that it carried into their adult life. And in order to continue creating these types of long-term fans, certain elements need to be honored, which means putting the most value into your products. And sure, not everything has to be evergreen. Not everything is some long-term goal. Some toys are just fads. They need to be pumped. There's deadlines whatever. But it seems counterintuitive to not factor in, I'd say, most of the time. With all that being said, Mattel is clearly doing something right with Monster High Gen 3, and here's why. Fans cannot stop raving famously about Gen 3 Abby Abominable, and there's also some pretty good reviews for Monster Ball Claudine Wolf. Abby is designed by the talented Christina Faline, who also designed a majority of the Monster High Gen 3 pets. I noticed she's been reposting Gen 3 Abby fan art, so make sure to tag her if you do create any fan art of Abby. Even Garrett Sander gave his stamp of approval under Christina's post. She looks ice cold stunning. It's also fun to see something I designed 13 years ago. Wow. Reimagined for a new generation of fans. Thanks for taking care of my ghoul. Talk about a scream come true. Abby is being praised for her cohesive design, clear comprehension of current fashion, and next level details and accessories. The silhouette definitely flatters the doll and perfectly captures Abby's personality. 
If you take a closer look, you'll notice that this version of Abby has adorable little horns on top of her head. And I would say that this Abby is not only one of the best Monster High Gen 3 dolls, but one of the best Abby Abominable dolls to ever exist in any generation. Do you approve of Abby's design? Do you think she's going to get a different body type? Let me know your thoughts down below. Claude, along with the rest of the Monster Ball line, aside from Claudine, have some very polarizing opinions. We have long-term Monster High fans praising the line for being akin to Sweet 1600 or Dawn of the Dance. And then there's the group that criticizes the line for its obnoxious neon colors, using the same characters, and uninspired hairstyles. Now that's not my opinion. That's not my opinion. I don't, I, I'm not putting those words in my mouth. I did not say that. <laughs> y'all don't, y'all don't even need to know my opinion on the line. I don't see how that's any of your business. So while Midnight Frankie may go down as the first Skelector flop, poor ghoul, I'm hopeful that the brand will continue to grow and evolve and inspire its targeted demographic. Given this information, how do you feel about Monster High? How do you feel about the brand right now? What would you like to see more of? What would you like to see change? Let's discuss it together down below. And if you're looking for the OG dolls, I will be auctioning a ton of them off on Whatnot on February 25th and 26th. Make sure you're there. The link is down in the description. You'll get $15 in credit. All the auctions start at a dollar. There's gonna be free giveaways. I think I'm more excited for it than some of y'all are. It's just, it's really, it's really fun just to get to interact with y'all and like be able to tell you the doll's backstory live as opposed to on another platform where it's not live and I can't really interact with whoever's buying the doll. If you do sign up, make sure you bookmark the live so you don't miss it. And as always, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, turn on notifications and hit subscribe so you never miss the tea on the toys you love. Thanks for watching. See ya.